Hi everyone, my name is David. My wife Katerina and I lead our University of Chicago ministry out here in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Chicago. So last week we talked about how we need close community, where we're known for who we are, where people can speak truth into our lives, and how that helps us become people of integrity. Today I want to talk about something else we need, which is friendships. We need true friends. Our need for friendships is highlighted from the first pages of the Bible. After God made Adam, he said, It is not good for man to be alone. And of course not. We're made in the image of a triune God. God, in his very essence, is community. So we're made for connection. But friendships are increasingly difficult to form and maintain in our modern world. A recent 2019 survey showed that one in four Americans have nobody to turn to when times get hard. And half of Americans report feeling isolated from others. And if you break it down by age, it's a whopping 80% for Gen Z. Mental health experts have been saying for years now that the world has a loneliness epidemic. And all this was before the COVID pandemic hit. In a world with so many social media apps and so many ways to pursue friendships and community, we're still so lonely. And I think it tells us that maybe this thing we all want is harder to get than we think. Friends who don't just take from each other, but freely give to each other. A friend who will lend a listening ear even if they've got a midterm the next day. Or a friend who will drive to the middle of nowhere to help you fix your flat tire. And a friend that you would do that for without a second thought. The kind of friends who, when they're together, they're more than the sum of the parts, making each one better, more robust, more powerful people. Right? Those kinds of friendships. Like we all want that. And today I want to look at a story of friendship from the Bible. It's a wonderful story from 2 Samuel 23 about King David and his mighty men who were 30 of King David's finest and fiercest warriors. And among the 30 were the three who were the innermost circle of David. And we get a description of the three starting in verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshua Bashabath, a Tachemanite, he was chief of the three. He wielded a spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahohi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day. And the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. So these are the three, Joshua, Bashabeth, Eleazar, and Shammah. These are some fierce warriors, single-handedly taking on 800 enemy warriors, standing their ground even in the most difficult of situations. And then we're told a story about something these three did. But before we read that story, I want to show you a quick video that we made to try to imagine how this story might have gone down if it happened in modern times over iMessage. So this will be from Joshua Bashabat's perspective. Checking on how these guys are doing. All right, L, Sham, L, Sham. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Where are you guys? We were supposed to be right here, right now. Sham, where are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little busy. Uh, they're shooting at me right now. So, are you okay? Yeah, I'll be there soon. I'll be there soon. See ya. Oh, what's going on? What's going? On? L, 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 L. Can you can you hear me? I don't see anything. L, what, what's going on? Oh, you guys are here. Let's go. Let's right. go. A few moments later.
So let's read this text. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it back to David. But he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord and said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. I used to have such a hard time resonating with this story. I couldn't get over how absurdly reckless and thoughtless and impractical these guys seemed. And then David spilling the water, like, at least drink the water, you know? Like, what's that all about? So what's happening here? In verse 13, it says, The three of the thirty chief men, they come down to the cave of Adullam, where David is hiding. And then we're told that this happens when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. Now, because of these details about the cave and the Philistines, we know that even though we're reading at the end of 2 Samuel, this story is not chronologically placed. The story probably happens in chapter 5, early in David's reign, just after David is anointed king. And as Israel was going through a transfer of power, the Philistines invaded Israel, and they got so far into Israelite territory that David had to relocate his headquarters temporarily from Jerusalem to this cave. Verse 13 also says that it was harvest time. So it's probably summer, it's hot, and David's thirsty. And so he says, oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. What's clear is that David does not mean that this should actually happen. David's hot, and he's probably pretty upset that the enemy Philistines have taken over his country, including his hometown, Bethlehem. And David, being a poet, laments by saying, oh, that someone would give me water. But these men, they take David's wish seriously. And it's funny for me to imagine that maybe it was because they were warriors, you know, not poets like David. And so they just took him literally like, hey, boss wants a drink. Let's go get it for him. But seriously, I wonder about the three mighty men. What is it about them and their friendship and their relationship with David that makes them start running toward Bethlehem? Maybe it's something like a man whose fiancée makes an offhand comment that she loves strawberries from Monterey. And the man flies out from Chicago to California, goes to Driscoll Farms, home of the most delicious strawberries, fills a refrigerated case with them, and then flies it back for her. Like, what would cause someone to do this kind of unthinking, reckless, borderline crazy thing? And whatever that is, maybe it was something like that for the mighty men. We can try to put labels on it. Love, loyalty, faithfulness. But clearly, such was their affection for David and such was their desire to serve and honor their king that when David says, oh, some water from Bethlehem would be nice, these three, they look at each other with knowing glances on their faces. And before you know it, they're off to Bethlehem, making the 12-mile trek from Adullam to Bethlehem through the summer heat They break through enemy lines, three men overcoming who knows how many Philistines at this stronghold, putting their lives on the line so that they could bring back a cup of water. And when they bring back the water, David is shocked. And what does David do? He pours it out. It's like if the fiancé took all the strawberries and dumped it into Lake Michigan. And you might think the men responded, wait, what? Like, what are you doing? Do you know what it took to get that water for you? But no. I think these men would have understood what David was doing. This was a libation, an offering in the form of pouring out. And as it's being poured out, this isn't about the water anymore. David knows that he's holding in his hand something incredibly precious. This water represents the love and the devotion of his men, their willingness to put their very lives on the line to please him and honor him. And David recognizes that he's not worthy of that kind of absolute loyalty and devotion. Only God deserves that. And so, he gives it back to God. And in so doing, David takes their extravagant, borderline impulsive act of love, and he ennobles it and honors it to the highest degree. He takes their act of selfless, self-giving love and says, let's give it to the one who is worthy. And they stand there, shoulder to shoulder, sharing a moment in which they're filled with awe and wonder together. What a friendship they had. What a love that they had for one another in service to their king. These are the exploits of the mighty. Remember, the Davidic kingdom was established by the military prowess of these mighty men. Battle after battle, the Philistines were defeated, and through them, the worship of Yahweh was reestablished. And as the Davidic narrative comes to a close, 
almost like the credits at the end of a movie. The writer here lists the mighty men who helped David establish the kingdom. And then, like a bonus post credit scene at the end of a Marvel movie, we're told one story about these mighty warriors to depict what these men were like. And this one story that the writer includes is one that has absolutely no military significance. It's just like something that happened, a miscommunication at best, reckless and foolish at worst. So why this story? Well, everyone knew the might of David and his men. And this story wants to answer the question, what made them so mighty? And what made them so mighty was not their strategic genius, their strength, their willpower, their discipline. No. What is the spirit of this story? What is on display here? It's love. The closeness of their friendship. A self-giving, sacrificial love. Reckless and foolish to the casual observer, but deeply felt by David and his mighty men. Would they have laid down their lives for one another? It's a no-brainer. Of course they would. But this amazing group of warriors didn't start off this way. They started off as a bunch of nobodies. But an unlikely group was formed, and we get that story in 1 Samuel 22. It says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So this was before David was king and he was on the run from Saul. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. So what kind of people were these? People in distress, in debt, bitter in soul. Just like David, they were fugitives, misfits of society. Perhaps some were criminals, outlaws, wanted. Warriors without a war to fight. Highly skilled renegades who would have bullied each other or even killed each other plundered the weak, and gone to work for some unsavory Philistine warlord. And how did these rejects of society end up becoming so awesome? How did they go from wanderers in distress and in debt to becoming the mighty men, men of valor and courage? What made the difference? It was David, a David, a man after God's own heart, God's anointed, the rightful king. David's courage, defeating Goliath when no one else would step forward to defend God's honor. And David's compassion, taking in outlaws and fugitives like them. It was David who made all the difference. That's what changed these misfits. Because of David, each of them were ennobled, living heroic lives. And all their strength and passion, unbridled and out of control, got channeled and redirected and unleashed as a blessing for Israel as they routed enemies and established God's will in the land. And because they had a rightful king and a cause to rally around, They were forged into a people, a group of friends, a band of brothers. And to get close like that, you need a cause and you need a king. And while we don't have King David, we have someone better. We have Jesus, our rightful king. Jesus, like David, became an outcast of society, even though he was the rightful Lord and king. And like David, Jesus also gathered the outcast of society around him. Think about the 12 disciples. One was a tax collector, hated by his own countrymen. Another, a zealot, which probably meant that he was something like a domestic terrorist trying to bring down Rome. Then you've got fishermen, and in his interactions, you see the marginalized flocking to him. People like Zacchaeus, another tax collector, Samaritan woman, Gentiles, lepers, the bleeding woman. And what happened to them as they gathered around Jesus? They found in Jesus a king who drew them out of their old lives and into something new. Their past Their diseases, their baggage was left behind, and each of them were given a new life. And here they found acceptance, their lives were ennobled as they drew closer to Jesus, and they found a new mission and purpose for their lives, a cause that they could live for. And along the way, they found themselves becoming part of a people, brothers and sisters, co-laborers and co-workers for God's kingdom, destroying barriers previously considered indestructible in the ancient world. Barriers between Jew and Gentile, between aristocrat and commoner, between slave and slave owner. And together, they became a redemptive community with the greatest transforming and unifying power that history has ever known. What can spark genuine friendship? What can forge people together? A cause and a rightful king. As we draw near to Jesus, sharing in his heart, becoming like him in character and deed, as we learn to love the things he loves and hate the things that he hates. We look around and we find that there's others who are running hard after Jesus as well. 
And like the spokes of a bicycle wheel get closer in distance as you move closer to the hub in the center, we find that as we get closer to Jesus, we get closer to one another. It's something like what David's mighty men experienced. Without David as their lord and king, they would have been a bunch of individual outcasts, fending for themselves with no cause but their own. But David's presence became a stable hub around which they became the mighty men. It strikes me that millennia later, we're left with this one story about David and his mighty men. This story of these three guys doing this foolish thing for David. But essentially, it's a story about love. It's the secret to David's mighty men and David's kingdom. And from this story, we learn that we don't have to wait around for big battles. This whole story starts with David being thirsty and homesick. It's an everyday moment that turned extraordinary because these three men disregarded what was practical. Too often, what defeats these moments of extravagant and self-giving love are practical concerns. And what could have been an utterly forgettable day in the life of David and his mighty men gets elevated into the vintage moment that captures not just these three, but all of the mighty men. And it's this spirit of extravagant love that God uses to establish his kingdom. And life is filled with opportunities to love extravagantly. Instead of sleeping early, it's choosing to stay up with a friend who's got yet another late-night paper to write. Instead of feigning ignorance, choosing to pay rent and utilities for a friend who's struggling to make ends meet. Instead of sending a text to a friend who's grieving a lost parent, it's jumping in a car to drive 100 miles to be there with her. An ordinary moment can be a chance to love extravagantly. And when I think about the most extravagant act of love in all history, it's got to be Jesus hanging on a cross. Like, what kind of foolish, senseless thing was that? But on the cross, we see God's loyal, faithful, self-giving love in its greatest form. John 15 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. I think about the three mighty men who loved David so much that they risked their lives to go to that well and get that water. Surely there were barriers and fears to overcome, enemy soldiers in the way, tactical issues to resolve. But none of that mattered because of their love for their king. Likewise, Jesus invites us to love one another as he has loved us. He invites us to live lives of extravagant, sacrificial, self-giving love. And we get a chance to overcome our fears and to do what these three mighty men did for King David, except we get to do it for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. So let's be people of love. Let's inspire one another toward greater love and good works, and not just for one another, but for Jesus. I think about some of my friends from college. There's Mike, a high school varsity soccer player who would stay up working on papers, by which I mean watching Champions League. There's Sam, a missionary kid who learned to be self-sufficient from a young age as he lived apart from his parents. One of the most competent, but also one of the strangest friends I had. And then there's me, a straight-edge kid who was all about academics and grades and wanting to be left alone so I could pursue my ambitions. We weren't ruffians or renegades, but we were all obsessed with our own small little personal battles, whether that was for comfort or for ambition. But then we gathered around Jesus, the rightful king. And as we hung out over many meals and times of sharing, as we served from tech to mission trips to cooking for the younger ones at church, we started to get close. And then as our affection for Jesus deepened, the strength of our friendships deepened. We fought battles against sin together. We fought for people's salvation together. And it grew us and it made us into something we weren't before. Brothers in Christ, fellow soldiers for the true and good King Jesus. We're not the mighty men by a long stretch, but I find myself doing something that I never thought I'd do. Leading a church as a full-time minister in the Midwest with my wife and two kids, working to save souls for Jesus at UChicago. And it's a similar story for my friends. Sam and his wife about to have their second child. They're about to uproot their families to lead a new church and take ground for Jesus near Purdue University this summer. And Mike, too, with his family, is moving to Boston with its crazy housing and childcare costs to advance God's kingdom near Tufts University. On the one hand, all of it seems utterly foolish. But on the other hand, I see strength and focus and significance in our lives now that I never would have expected when we were in college. And my point isn't that we need to all go and plant churches, 
but that in a small way, our story can be the story of the mighty men. And that's a story of people who are in distress and in debt because of their sin. People whose energies and passions were being shot off in random directions without purpose. But those people can be gathered around the rightful king, given a new cause, a meaningful and eternal cause that they could give their lives to. And it's a story I've seen repeated many times before I ever got here. And it's still continuing in the younger ones, as I hear about seniors in our ministry choosing to set aside a six-figure salary offer at some nice tech company to devote a year to preaching the gospel. That's so inspiring to me. Let's keep finding ways to love Jesus extravagantly. Let's not give in to the voices of practicality. And instead, let's love God and let's love people freely, wastefully even, just as Jesus did for us. And my prayer is that as we do, God will establish His kingdom through Jesus' mighty men and women of this generation. Let's take some time now to pray and to respond to the message. Let's pray together. Father, we're inspired by David and his mighty men whose love and sacrifice for one another enabled them to establish your kingdom in their generation. Lord, we see that the loyal love that these men had for each other is the same kind of love that you showed to us by going to the cross for us, laying down your life for our blessing. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Lord, I pray that each of us would have the spirit of David and his mighty men, Lord, and that you would use us mightily to accomplish your will on earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.